This time on Project House, we travel to Northwest Arkansas to see how a veteran trim carpenter lays out and installs panel wainscoting. Well, we came down to Northwest Arkansas, the land of big houses with big trim packages, so that we could work with one of the best trim carpenters we've known in the magazine, Gary Striegler. The plan here is to trim out this entire room, all based around the feature trim detail of the room, paneled wainscot, which we'll build using Gary's simplified bench-built technique that he's developed over his long career as a trim carpenter. Well, there's nothing quite like a fresh job site. Drywallers have done their thing, and it's all set for trim. Gary, good to see you. So good to see you. So we're here to do wainscot. Where do we start? The first thing we've got to do is get all the moldings up around the windows and doors so we'll know the actual size of the finished panels that we're going to build. But before we can do any of that, we've got to get the window sill in this window. Right, window casing's got to land on top of the window sill. That's it exactly. Now, I've already calculated that I need a five inch deep window sill because we've got a lot of buildup that's going to go on underneath this. You do love your buildup. <laughs> That's right, you can't hardly have too much trim, right? <laughs> uh, also, I like to make that sill out of one inch thick material, which we call five quarter. It just makes for a much more substantial look. Okay. So we know this is gonna be five inches. Now, the other thing we need to allow for is how much side projection for all that trim. Okay. And I know that that's gonna be 12 inches. So I'm gonna shoot you my tape measure, and if you'll just burn me 12 inches on your inside jam extension over there, we'll have the width that we need, and we'll be ready to make this sill. To figure out how far the sill extends to either side of the window, Gary adds up the pieces. Starting with a standard quarter inch jam reveal, he adds in the four inch casing, three quarter inch back band, and a one inch overhang for a total of six inches on each side of the window, or a total of 12 inches added to the distance between jam sides. Right there. Okay, I've got that at 93 and a quarter, so we need a 93 and a quarter by five inch sill. Okay. To mill the window sill, Gary begins with five quarter poplar stock, cuts it to rough length, then he runs it through the planer on edge to get the finished width. Next, he makes several passes on both surfaces, taking even cuts off both faces of the board until he reaches the desired one inch thickness. After edging and surfacing the board, Gary cuts the sill to its finished length and pulls out his router to put a profile on the edge. So this is the profile that goes to the bottom side. Okay. I always make sure the profile steps underneath, which is, I think, the traditional way of doing it. And what I'm going to do now is just lower this bit enough to round it over on the top to kind of creates a bullnose look. While Gary rounds the top edge of the sill, I use a multi-tool, guided by a scrap of sill stock, to cut back the window mullions to make room for the sill once it's ready. It looks really good for me, so mark that and then throw your tape on and see if it's actually six inches. How about uh, six inches on the money? To fit into place, the sill will require a pair of notches on each end. The first notch allows the sill to recess into the window opening and fit snugly against the drywall. The second notch will leave a gap for the wainscot to slip behind. It's all this thinking about the different layers and attention to detail that I love about trim carpentry. A jigsaw would work for these notches, but it's not as clean of a cut as you get by making a stopped cut on a table saw and then holding the stock at an angle on the miter saw to get a sharp 90 degree notch. Well, let's see how we did. It's great. I'm absolutely loving it here. Let's nail it. To ensure that the casing will sit flat and make full contact with the window jam, Gary first looks for any problem areas like drywall projecting past the window. Problem areas are either cut away with the multi-tool or just pounded back with a hammer. Next, he sets his combination square to a quarter inch and marks the reveal on the jams. Then he cuts the casing, two at a time, a few inches longer than needed, and holds them in place to transfer his marks. Then, it's time to cut the miters. Okay. Now, something that Gary likes to do on his casing is you take your lock plane and you just ease the back half of the casing profile. You might be tempted to just set the saw when you're making this 45 degree cut at a slight bevel, and that would bevel the back edge. But if you do that, that's going to mess up 
this profile here and it's not going to join together the right way. So you just take a nice sharp block plane, you ease the back, the front still stays crisp and everything joins together nice on the wall. Backplaning removes material from the back side of the joint so that the front part that you can see comes together nice and tight. You'll see us do it throughout the project. To fasten the casing, Gary likes to space nails about every six to eight inches. I'm loving the way that looks now. You got it pulled up nice and tight. When we measure for the top piece, Gary cuts it a hair long, so we'll have a little room to finesse the miters into position. It may take a little longer, but the results are worth it. All right, well, let's see what we got. So you want about a sixteenth on this end? That's what I'm hoping for. Gary, I'm about an eighth over over here. So I'm hitting on the inside here. Yeah, me too. Okay, so we need to trim the inside on both of them. And, you know, we're staying really good and parallel with the header, which means that, you know, there's not really anything bowed. We just need to modify our cut. Okay. Well, let's see how we did. Once the lengths are dialed in, we add a little glue to the miter joints and nail it off. Window jams can sometimes be bowed, so keep an eye on the reveals as you work. And if necessary, use a chisel to pry things into alignment before fastening. That's beautiful. Now one of the most common problems you're going to run into when putting wainscot up on the walls is that it ends up being thicker, it sticks out farther than the window and door casing. You end up seeing this ugly end grain and that problem only gets worse when you put the cap on top. So what we need to do is add a piece of molding called a back band. And that goes on around the window and door casing so that when we butt up our wainscot we have a nice clean termination point. So before we can move on to laying out the wainscot we have to get this back band installed around the windows and doors. The back band overlaps the outer edge of the casing, so it's important to remember that you don't mark where it meets the top of the casing, but where it meets the miter joint of the casing. A back band molding is the key to integrating wainscot into a room. Whether it's a new room like this one, or a room with existing moldings, back band allows you to build up the projection of the window and door casing, giving you a clean termination point for the wainscot paneling. Once I've got the hang of Gary's workflow, we just motor through the room and get all the casing and back band installed. With the openings prepped, we can move on to the next phase of this project, Wayne Scott Layout.